AP Biology, Genetics, Part 4. We left off in Part 3 on pleiotropy, which is one gene having multiple effects. And a lot of genes are pleiotropic, and especially for some diseases like cystic fibrosis and sickle cell, the one mutated gene results in a whole mess of problems, a whole bunch of problems, and that's called pleiotropy. And again, once again, with sickle cell, if you have that hemoglobin causing your cells to sickle, uh, it clogs up your arteries and veins, causes things like stroke, heart attack, et cetera, et cetera, and those multiple effects are caused by that one gene, again, pleiotropy. The next concept that we're going to talk about with uh, genetics is something called epistasis. Epi means on top of, and what this means is one gene that has to be turned on first in order for the second gene to work at all. So for mice, we have, and this is our example of epistasis, we have a pigment gene, and if you have the dominant allele, that means you're going to produce pigment, either black or brown fur. But if you don't have the big C, if you don't have that pigment allele, if you're little c, little c, you don't turn on black or brown alleles, and you don't have any pigment. So if you're little c, little c, no matter what your brown and black genes are, you will be a white mouse, because you, the absence of color produces a white mouse, and there's like no pigment at all. It's basically an albino. So if we take a look at our cross here, we have big B, big B, which would normally produce a black mouse, but since this first gene isn't turned on, it's on top, epi, on top of this other gene, there is no pigment being produced because that gene has been turned on for pigment. If it's little c, little c, in all of these cases, the alleles for black or brown fur never uh, get expressed and you don't have any color in the mouse at all. Now, if you look at these other mice, we have big C, little c, and big C, big C. It doesn't matter if you're heterozygote or homozygous dominant. Uh, as long as you get the allele for pigment, then the second gene is turned on. And then we kind of, you kind of have to do like step one, see if you make pigment, and then step two, what pigment you're going to make. And if you never make it past step one, uh, then you don't have to worry about whether or not you have black or brown fur as a mouse. So if we take a look here, we have big C, little c, so we're going to make some pigment. That gene is on top of, or epi the uh, brown black fur gene, to uh, the black allele is going to be represented by the dominant uh, allele for this trait. Letter B is going, a big B, is going to represent that black allele. Little b represents the recessive allele or brown fur color. So if you're big B, big B, you're definitely going to have black fur. If you're a heterozygote, big B, little b, black fur is dominant to brown fur, so this mouse appears black. And then over here we have big C, big C, so pigment's been turned on, and little b, little b means the mouse will be brown. So this is what epistasis is all about, and mouse uh, fur color is a good example of it. Polygenic. Poly means many, genic means genes. There's more than one gene that controls things like skin color. And there's a whole bunch of stuff that uh, is polygenic in humans, and that's what makes uh, genetics kind of difficult. It's not just simple dominance recessive, purple flowers, white flowers. For skin color, um, we have three genes, three different genes, located on different chromosomes, that control the amount of melanin you produce. Now just to point it out, the dominant characteristic is to produce melanin. The recessive characteristic is a lack of production of melanin, and that's what gives your skin your color. Whether it's really light or really dark or anywhere in between, it's the number of dominant alleles that you got from your parents that determine your skin color. So let's take a look here. Just looking at the first trait, big A, little a, big A, little a, there's a couple possibilities. When you do the pundit square on this, you can have big A, big A, big A, little a, or little a, little a. If you have little a, little a, that's represented over here, you're not going to make much uh, pigment for that first gene. For big A, little a, when you cross big A, little a with big A, little a, you can either, you'll have one of each allele, one for no uh, pigment and one for pigment. And over here we have the first gene heterozygote, first gene heterozygote, first gene heterozygote. So that might make a little bit more pigment for that first uh, gene. Then the other possibility with big A, little a, big A, little a is big A, big A. And over here, for the first gene, two of the melanin making alleles, which is going to produce lots more melanin. Now if you do that for each one of the three traits, big A, little a, cross with big A, little a, big B, little b, cross with big B, little b, big C, little c, cross with big C, little c, there's the possibility of producing an offspring that's all uh, albino that doesn't have any of the alleles for uh, producing pigment in the skin. And this person would be very, very light indeed. Or in this cross of two medium skinned people, you could get all the dominant alleles for each one of the traits. You could be a homozygous dominant for 
the first gene, the second gene, and the third gene for this, which would make the person's skin color very, very dark. So as you can see, uh, and if you want to do play around with the crosses and stuff like that, but you could have uh, a case where you have two light-skinned people making a dark-skinned person or two dark-skinned people making a light-skinned per person, and that kind of question comes up all the time. And this is the result of the accumulation of more than one allele for pigment color in the skin. And this is an example of polygenic inheritance, or more than one gene controlling a trait. And here we have a whole bunch of stuff that uh, is polygenic. There are many traits that are polygenic. Albinoism, a lack of alleles. Uh, here we have a person that uh, doesn't have uh, probably any alleles for melanin in skin. And that can be produced from two heterozygote parents. There's no problems with that. All right, it's nature versus nurture. This is called multifactorial, many, more than one trait. You've probably heard of that, nature versus nurture. Is it the result of your genetics or your, the result of your environment? The answer in biology is, is that it's both. It's, it's almost always both. For example, you could have light-colored skin, but as a result of your environment, the nurture part, the part that um, is not coded for by DNA, you can make your skin darker. Uh, you can, you know, start off life, you know, being fairly thin or fairly, you know, heavy set. But, you know, by based on your environment and the foods you eat and your exercise, you can modify your body type as well to some extent. Here we have hydrangea, hydrangeas that um, have uh, an effect based on the soil pH. That is the uh, the environment part. So the genetics causes the uh, the plant to normally produce purple flowers. However, if the soil pH is low, if it's in an acid soil environment the environment also can have a, a role in the color of the flowers. And this here made it purple. Nature versus nurture, environment versus genetics, it's both, and that's called multifactorial. Skin color and hydrangeas are two examples of this. Now, we learned a lot about this using uh, fruit flies, and that's all we're going to go with it, with uh, fruit flies. However, the next step, sex link characteristics, involves fruit flies as well. Here we have a fruit fly with the red eyes, that's called wild type, it's just what's the most common phenotype in a population. And then we have the mutant white-eyed male, uh, and we learned some things about that, including sex-linked traits that we're going to talk about next. Sex linkage, so basically we had a red-eyed female with white-eyed male, and all the offspring that were red-eyed were female, all the white eyes were male. So that kind of made us think that, uh, scientists were thinking that maybe these traits were controlled by uh, something on the X chromosome. because or the Y chromosome, because uh, the males have one X, one Y, the females have two Xs, and that's the only real difference between males and females as far as chromosomes. Sex-linked traits. Although the differences between women and men are many, you know, one gene controlling many traits, the chromosomal basis of sex is rather simple. Females get two Xs, males get an X and a Y. Here we have a karyotype, a picture of the chromosomes for a male, XY. Remember these other 22 pairs are called autosomes. The Y chromosome has um, uh, genes on it that turn on the production of male hormones that, during the developing fetus, turn that female developing fetus into a male, basically turning the innies into outies and, you know, giving us our stuff. And one of the reasons why males have nipples is because we started as female. However, the Y chromosome didn't erase some of that equipment that would have developed into uh, uh, functional equipment as far as nipples on uh, females. On men, they're just kind of decorations. The X chromosome has other things other than just sex determination. Things like uh, hemophilia uh, are determined by the X chromosome. Duchenne muscular dystrophy and color blindness are all X chromosome traits. The reason why there's not a lot on the Y chromosome is just because it's a smaller chromosome. There's just not as much information to go wrong. There's more things that can go wrong with the X chromosome, so these sex-linked uh, traits are typically the result of X chromosomes malfunctioning. Now this is kind of funny, you can read this if you want, but why are guys the way they are? Maybe these are the things that are really on the white chromosome that cause us to be the way we are. All right, sex link traits. Uh, here we have a female. Females are represented by circles. Males are represented by squares. Uh, this cross here shows a, um, this is for hemophilia. Now hemophilia is a recessive trait. So which one of these two letters would represent a recessive trait? Big H or little h? The answer is little h. So little h means that the hemophilia allele is present. Big H is for the normal allele. And just to give you a little background on hemophilia, it basically is a failure of your blood to clot. So if you get a cut that's pretty severe, you could bleed to death because the, the clot doesn't form and you don't stop the bleeding. 
Now, usually like a little nick doesn't do that, and uh, there are drugs to help the people that have hemophilia, but it is a disease carried on the X chromosome, and this is a, an example of a sex-linked trait. Here we have a female that has the normal allele and the recessive hemophilia allele, and she's going to be okay. She has the normal allele, she has two X chromosomes, and the normal allele hides the recessive. As we're going to find out, males aren't so lucky on that. Here we have a normal male. He uh, has the normal allele represented by big H and Y chromosome, which doesn't have that gene on it. And the male produces either sperm with X or Y chromosomes in it. Female just produces X. However, when the female makes her gametes, she's going to have some that are half that are going to be uh, normal and half have the hemophilia allele. For the men, the X chromosome will always have the normal allele for this cross, and the uh, Y chromosome doesn't have anything on it. So let's look at the offspring possibilities. Here we have one possibility, big H, big H, completely normal female, no carrier. Over here we have the male getting the normal allele and the Y chromosome, no problems here. Uh, over here, we have the female giving the recessive hemophilia allele, but he, she got the uh, normal allele from dad, so she's going to be okay, but she's a carrier. Carrier is represented by a half-shaded circle, or a square if it's a male. Over here, we have a square, and this guy is going to have hemophilia. Now, he got uh, hemophilia from his mom, and since the Y chromosome doesn't overshadow the X, this kid is going to fully express hemophilia. hemophilia. The reason why males typically get sex linked traits is because they don't have a second X chromosome with a normal allele that can hide a recessive allele. That's something that you should know about this. The other thing that you should know is that um, females tend to be carriers of this disease and uh, don't express it. Uh, and that's how this thing gets spread is because the female doesn't even know she's a carrier. Another thing that you should know is that the dad, and this is important, the dad never gives their kid these X-linked traits, because what did dad give to the kid? A Y chromosome, and there's no disease on the Y chromosome. So fathers can never pass on hemophilia to their sons. Now fathers can pass it on to their daughters. If this was little h instead of big h, and this is little h here, the only way a daughter can get hemophilia is if the dad already has hemophilia, he would know, little h and y, he would have it, and the, the mother was the uh, carrier or has a full-blown case. And uh, if little h and little h comes together, then the daughters can get it. But, you know, that doesn't happen as often. So X-linked uh, traits follow the X chromosome. Those are mainly the sex-linked traits. Males get the X from their mother, and the trait is never passed on from father to son. Y-linked traits, there's very few on there. There's only 26 genes, and uh, you never uh, pass on uh, X's to the son, only Y's. So uh, females cannot inherit the trait if there is a problem on the Y chromosome. Uh, if it's a Y disorder, and those are rare, you don't have to know of them, but you should know that if it is a Y-linked trait that's a disorder, the females can't get it because she always gets an X. All right, pedigree analysis. We have males represented by squares. We have females represented by circles. If someone has the trait, they have it shaded in, and if, uh, if it's a female with the trait, they'll have it shaded in too. So as we can see here, we have a male and a female. The line represents a marriage. And uh, all these little squares and X, uh, boxes uh, and circles are the children. So here we have two or one daughter and three sons. Two with whatever trait we're looking for. In this case, it's widow's peak, that little point in the middle. And um, two without it. Now the the mom was little w little w. And if she's going to, if she's not going to have widow's peak, uh, if she has two of the recessive alleles, it's only if you have the dominant allele that you get the widow's peak. And that's what we're looking at here. Keep in mind, let's say we didn't know this was big W, little w. I mean, if it's shaded, that means she could have had widow's peak as big W, big W. Oh, I'm sorry, this is male. This male could have big W, big W, or big W, little w. How would you know which one's which? Well, if it was big W, big W, and you cross it with little w, little w, if you do the punish square, you get all kids with big W, little w, if this was big W, big w. And if that's the case, all the kids would have widow's peak. So as you can see, two of the kids don't have widow's peak, so that means they must have got a little w from one parent and a little w from the other parent, which means that this parent has to be big w, little w, in order to give a little w to the child that doesn't have widow's peak. And that's how you analyze these pedigrees, looking at the parents and the children. And if you see some recessive children that have two of the recessive alleles, then you know the parent that has the dominant allele isn't homozygous dominant, must be a heterozygote. So take a look at these, uh, uh, these pedigrees, which are family trees and uh, look for the patterns.
here we have big F representing the uh, free ear lobes. That's a dominant trait. And then we have the attached ear lobes represented by little f. The only way you can have attached ear lobes is to be little, uh, little f, little f. And in this pedigree, the trait that we're analyzing is the attached ear lobes. So in order to have the shaded, you have to have little f, little f. All right, so what to look for in pedigrees. If males are getting the trait, it's probably sexling. If two people with normal phenotypes give it to the child, they must, um, must be a recessive trait because the parents would have it if it was a dominant trait. And if most people in the pedigree have the trait, it could be dominant because if those heter heterozygotes are going to have the trait if they have the dominant allele, if it's a dominant disorder. This ends part, um, part four of your genetics notes.